This is CBC Here and Now. I am the MHA who launched the formal complaint against Minister Joyce. How can you be a bully if you're dealing with everybody in the House of Assembly? We need a whole cultural change in the way we do politics. It absolutely has to shift. I did experience an incident in the fall and I'm going to um, now submit a formal complaint and follow the process. Late uh, last evening I had uh, spoken to uh, Mr. Joyce made the decision to remove him from, from cabinet. Eddie Joyce is out of cabinet and out of caucus. It comes 24 hours after CBC first told you he was the subject of a harassment allegation at the House of Assembly. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Last night, Joyce was relieved of his ministerial duties. Then, later this afternoon, he was forced out of the caucus. This after two women leveled harassment and bullying accusations against him. As new information became available today, we've reviewed the tapes now. I've met with Mr. Joyce. I've directed and he's volunteered now to remove himself from caucus. So that decision has been made. And again, I continue people, uh, continue to encourage people to come forward. In an unexpected move, Service NL Minister Sherry Gambon Walsh told the public she is the Liberal MHA who made an official complaint about Eddie Joyce's behavior. Gambon Walsh spoke to reporters just before question period this afternoon, setting off a firestorm of reaction. I'm talking about this now because unfortunately, Minister Joyce, uh, unfortunately today, my name has been put out in the general public and you know, it's, I, my intent was for the process to work itself out, but that's not happening and I, I wish for it to happen and I want it to happen. And I'm standing here and speaking to you because I want the process and I want people to feel comfortable to come forward if they're experiencing any form of harassment. Now for his part, Joyce says he has no idea what Gambon Walsh is talking about. He says he doesn't see how he could be a bully when he's so busy helping people, especially opposition MHAs. Go ask Kevin Parsons how many summer jobs I got as students. If that's being a bully, if someone's scared that I'm a bully, go ask uh, Keith Hutchings how many summer jobs I got his students. Go ask Keith Hutchings how many times he's been over, over my house. Go ask Tracy Perry, March 4th. I helped Tracy Perry at a, with a seat down in the district. She sent me, uh, uh, thank you very, ever so much with a smiley face. Is that being a bully with, with people? Like that's well, all of this comes as another MHA comes forward to say she was harassed by Eddie Joyce. All right, let's bring in here now is Peter Cowan, who sat through a very unusual day at the legislature. Peter, what's this new allegation? Well, it's funny that Eddie Joyce should mention Tracy Perry because she's actually the MHA who's come forward and said that she was subject of harassment by Eddie Joyce last fall. She was the one who sent an email to the House leader, Andrew Parsons, with her concerns at the time. She's not going to go into the specifics of what happened, but she said uh, she felt that it was bullying and there were efforts to try and intimidate as well as embarrass her. She's going to launch a formal complaint as part of the same process that we saw Ms. Gambon Walsh going through and she said she'll provide more details through that process. When I asked her today, well, why didn't she come forward in the fall? She said at that time she thought it was maybe just her, but as news developed over the past couple of weeks that there were other people complaining, she felt she had to come forward as well. To stand up for all women and all persons who are considering politics because uh, it's the 21st century now. Um, politics um, may have been ruled by bullying and that might have been the way things were done in the past. Uh, it's no longer acceptable. We want more women in the workplace. We want more men to feel comfortable here as well. It is time to change. So Peter, how did all this play out at the House today? Well, today's sitting of question period was unlike any that I have ever witnessed because Ms. Gambon Walsh's uh, claim that it was Eddie Joyce outed her essentially as the person who made the complaint uh, happened just as she was coming in here and that basically just steamrolled over question period and all the questions that the opposition had, had planned with demands that Eddie Joyce be removed from caucus for essentially re-victimizing her by making the complaint public. Uh, and it took a bit of while, a, a little bit of time, because this was the first that the Premier had 
even heard about this. Uh, the opposition asked for just a recess for everyone to sort of regroup, uh, look at the information, consider it. Instead, what the government did is basically shut the House down for the rest of the week, and it won't sit again until Monday. Um, but it gave the caucus a chance to try and review all this, figure out what to do, and eventually, uh, as we heard from Dwight Ball earlier, the, decide to remove Eddie Joyce from the Liberal caucus. He'll now have to sit as an independent. But we heard after the House was shut down some pretty harsh words from the two leaders on the opposition side of the benches. What Mr. Joyce did by calling out the women who had laid uh, uh, complaints against him was disrespectful to the House, disrespectful to every MHA here in this House, and disrespectful to the people of the province. Again, it was extreme vengefulness and intimidation tactics. There's a complete and total lack of leadership over there. They've, they've clearly said policies about protecting women and safe workplaces. And when they've had their chance to shine and show how meaningful those very important topics are to them, they've been a complete and total failure in dealing with it. Now, we don't know how long this investigation is going to take, but one of the things the Premier said today is he wants the results of that investigation before he makes any decisions about whether Eddie Joyce will be welcomed back as a Liberal. Reporting live at the House of Assembly, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Not like Eddie Joyce's personality to be like a fine gentleman. We went to Eddie Joyce's district of Humber Bay of Islands to get some reaction. Colleen Connors has that for you when we return to this top story in 10 minutes. Well, RNC officers are descending on Labrador City tonight after a late night shooting left one man dead. Police say 30 year old Vince Ward has been charged with first degree murder in connection with the incident. Here now is Jacob Barker is in Labrador with more details on what's happening. So Jacob, what do we know? And uh, I'm afraid uh, that we will have to break away from you, Jacob. We're not able to hear the audio. We okay. Uh, our apologies. Hi, I'm meteorologist Jay Scotland. Ryan Snodden is away tonight. We have some rainfall and wind warnings to talk about, and I'll be back with a look at your full forecast coming up a little bit later in the show. Well, the St. John's Edge and the London Lightning are about an hour away from tip-off. It is Game 5 of their Best of Seven series, but there is a cloud of controversy hanging over the visiting team. Yeah, there certainly is. It involves star player Royce White. It's alleged that the former league MVP yelled a homophobic slur at some fans during Saturday night's game in St. John's. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has been following this story, and he's live at Mile One Center tonight. Jeremy, what is happening? So Debbie, high level athletes like Royce often feed off the crowd and there's nothing that they enjoy more than beating the home team on their home court. But on Saturday night, a war of words went a little too far. Now the CBC has heard that as the game, Saturday night's game was winding down, some St. John's Edge fans here in the sands behind us started heckling Royce White, who is last year's MVP, and that White himself turned to the fans and said, shut up and then use a homophobic slur that begins with the letter F that we are not allowed to say on TV. Now, last night, Royce put out a lengthy statement on the London Lightning's Twitter feed saying that he denies any allegations of homophobic slurs and that it was him who was victimized. Royce White is a mental health advocate and he claims that fans were making disability slurs. Now, his statement reads that this isn't acceptable and that the NBL Canada needs to address it, saying that inebriated fans shouldn't be allowed so close to the bench. As for the fans, well, they're not buying this. Rich at Dickey and L said he was there when it happened and that he wasn't drunk and that he heard White make multiple homophobic slurs. We also received an email from Liam Oakley who said he was one of the fans on the receiving ends of those slurs. Now Oakley says he understands that emotions run high during the game but that White is lying and that he definitely yelled at fans 
using the F word and that he should apologize. Now, earlier this afternoon, I spoke with the Deputy Commissioner of the MBL Canada, Audley Stevenson, and he said that he did receive an email from a fan and that he followed up on it. He spoke with the London Lightning staff, he spoke with the St. John's Edge staff, he spoke with security, he read the security report, and in the end, there was no actual evidence that this had happened. So we're gonna, he's gonna join us live later on in the show so we can hear a little bit more about it. Now, as for the St. John's Edge, this is the area that we're talking about. There's gonna be additional security put in here, and there's gonna be a few additions added so that this floor and this game is safer for both the players and the fans. And everyone in this building is hoping that that off-court drama doesn't spread onto the court for game five that's just about to get underway in 50 minutes. Reporting live from Mile One Stadium, Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Comedian Bill Cosby has been found guilty on three counts of aggravated indecent assault. The jury in his retrial delivered the verdict in a Philadelphia courtroom this afternoon. 80-year-old Cosby was silent as he left the courthouse, but his lawyer gave a short statement. We are, we are very disappointed by the verdict. We don't think Mr. Cosby is guilty of anything, and the fight is not over. Cosby's lawyer says they will appeal more than 60 women claim the TV star drugged and molested them over a 50-year span. Cosby could get up to 10 years in jail for each of today's convictions. For now, he remains free on bail. The federal Liberal Party recently adopted a motion calling for the decriminalization of sex work. So what do people here think about that? Here now's Mark Quinn went out to find out. On the streets of St. John's, there's mixed reaction to the idea of decriminalizing sex work. I think it's working, uh, the system is working, and it should stay the same way it is. If this is going to happen regardless, whether it's legal or not, and these people are going to be doing this, and at least providing them a safe place, uh, you know, will prevent something far worse from happening, you know. You know, we don't want to hear about sex workers uh, getting hurt. I don't have any reason to think it should be uh, criminal, I suppose. Um, so I wouldn't be opposed to it being decriminalized, but I don't have any particular reason to be sort of um, a big proponent for it to be decriminalized either. They're commenting on a motion that was adopted at a Liberal Party policy convention in Halifax last week. Here at City Hall, at least one city councillor clearly supports decriminalization of sex work. I think that when we regulate industries, it makes it safer for the people who work within those industries to go to work every day. Jameson also believes that legalizing sex work might help resolve tension between the sex trade and residents of areas like this. Mm -hmm. And in any sort of commercial activity, there can be conflicts with residential dwellings. And so that's what we're trying to assage with our work in the development regulation. So we want to make sure that there is harmony in neighborhoods wherever we choose to insert commercial activity in them. And that's the challenge that we face and we're working hard with community groups and those involved in the sex trade to find a good balance there. If it does happen, the legislative changes required to decriminalize sex work aren't expected until after the 2019 federal election. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, let's return now to a story coming out of Labrador City this evening. That's where RNC officers are descending on the area after a late night shooting left one man dead. Police say 30 year old Vince Ward has been charged with first degree murder in connection with the incident. Our Jacob Barker is in Labrador City with more details on what's happening. Jacob, what do we know at this point? A lot of disbelief in Labrador City that something like this could happen in the small community. Something like this hasn't happened there for a very long time. But it was last night that RNC uh, showed up at a residence and they were responding to a call about an altercation between two men. Uh, once they arrived, they found one man dead inside the house. Police say it was an isolated incident and that the men did know one another. RNC has not released the name of the deceased, saying they are still working to positively identify him and notify the next of kin. They did provide us with an update uh, today about their investigation, and here's a little bit of what they had to say. 
motivation behind the homicide as well as the moments leading up to it and the circumstances around the entire incident are certainly part of the investigation uh, and that'll certainly be something that investigators once they do hit the ground in Labrador City will uh, be actively uh, you know looking to speak with witnesses or anyone who may have information uh, officers who are on scene in Labrador City this morning uh, certainly started uh, the ball rolling on that part of the investigation and the town is reeling from this. The people I was speaking with were just learning about it as the news was breaking. And I spoke with the mayor a little bit about what it means for this community to have something happen like this so close to home. A lot of shock. Uh, you know, obviously you can imagine in a small town, a lot of speculation, a lot of rumor. The only thing I really ask of the community is uh, out of respect for both the deceased and the uh, accuser, uh, just let... You know, the RNC do their job, journalists like yourself do, do their job, and uh, let the story unfold as it does and uh, not speculate and not spread rumors. Now, RNC says that there are officers coming from Cornerbrook and St. John's to assist with the investigation. Also, that the coroner's office is looking into the cause of death, and police are asking for anyone, anybody with any information about the shooting to come forward. Reporting live for here and now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. A reminder, you can watch here and now anytime, anywhere. We're broadcasting live on YouTube and you can find past episodes on demand. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBCNL. I'm Colleen Connors in Cornerbrook, and behind me is the beautiful view of Eddie Joyce's district, Humber Bay of Islands. And coming up, I'm going to tell you what people there have to say about him tonight.
Welcome back once again. Returning now to the Confederation Building. It all began earlier this week with opposition leader Paul Davis raising allegations of bullying and harassment within the Liberal Party. This morning, Minister Sherry Gambin Walsh revealed she had filed a formal complaint against MHA Eddie Joyce and then another MHA with another complaint. Let's hear now from the two women at the center of the allegations. Difficult week as an MHA and a difficult week as a woman. And why is that? Uh, I am the MHA who launched the formal complaint against Minister Joyce. And I encourage, as an MHA, I encourage anybody out there who has experienced harassment to come forward. Can you tell us exactly what happened? No, you know, I really want us to use the process and to work our way through the process. When, when the Premier told the House and told reporters he didn't know anything about this, was that accurate? That's accurate. I spoke to the Premier at 8.30, uh, just after 8.30 yesterday morning and launched the formal, formal verbal complaint. And was there ever any mediation between you and Mr. Joyce prior to this week with uh, the Premier's Chief of Staff? I, I launched a formal complaint at 08.30 yesterday morning. That's all I'm willing to say right now. Right. And why are you talking about this now? I'm talking about this now because, unfortunately, Minister Joyce, uh, unfortunately, today, my name has been put out in the general public, and I'm standing here and speaking to you because I want the process, and I want people to feel comfortable to come forward if they're experiencing any form of harassment. With respect to the culture of bullying, um, it is very much alive and well in the House of Assembly today. And uh, I did experience an incident in the fall, and I'm going to um, now submit a formal complaint and follow the process. If I continue to experience bullying problems myself, or if I saw that any colleague of mine was experiencing bullying, that I, uh, I would be prepared to stand up for them in the House of Assembly. And to stand up for all women and all persons who are considering politics, because uh, it's the 21st century now, um, politics um, may have been ruled by bullying, and that might have been the way things were done in the past. Uh, it's no longer acceptable. We want more women in the workplace. We want more men to feel comfortable here as well. It is time to change. Uh, we have to bear in mind there's going to be a new policy brought forward uh, in June by the Liberal government, and it's going to impose a limitation on when people can bring complaints forward. It's going to impose a 90-day limitation. So um, if anyone has concerns, we're running out of time. Uh, we only have the month of May. Now, reacting to Sherry Gammon Walsh's comments, Eddie Joyce was very clear he does not see a problem with his behavior. In explaining the work he does for fellow MHAs, he revealed another complaint made against him by a female MHA, told reporters about PC MHA Tracy Perry raising concerns about him before she'd said anything publicly. I'm, I, I have no idea where, where anybody ever said that I was a bully. To your knowledge, ha, has Tracy Perry ever made a complaint that you are a bully? Well, Tra Tracy Perry came, uh, and, and we could talk about this, Tracy Perry came uh, to me one day uh, about SEEP, and I said, put it in writing. Then she wrote me a note, and I wrote back. Uh, she wrote me a letter saying disrespectful, things like that. And I wrote back, and I said, look, I asked all images. I got all this in the email. I wrote back and said, look, put it in writing. I'll SEEP. She came back as per your request. She put it in writing. Most of the funding was approved. She came back again, more funding was approved. So, so look, I haven't spoken to Tracy Perry. But to your knowledge, has she written complaints about you being a bully? Not a complaint, she wrote me the saying she didn't like my behavior, but my behavior itself is when I said to her, she came across to my, uh, to, to a part of the floor with me and talked about Seep. I said, pull in right, as I did every MHJ in the house. That means you have two female MHAs who've complained about your but bullying. She, but she, I never, but just because I, she said that I had put, asked her to put in writing, that's not bullying. Like for me a bully, if I said to you or anybody else, if I said something. But part about that with the bullying is that I asked her to do the same thing I asked every MHA from her side and their side. That's not bullying. Right. That's following the procedures. She, what she did, she wrote the letter as per your request and she got the funding. Just so she could make wet town, she wanted the funding. So that's not bullying. But I understand, you seem to be arguing so long as you dole out money to MHAs, you're not a bully. 
Yeah, but, but how it's not bullying of money. Like, like you're trying to make this a story when it's not a story. How is it bullying when I'm asking, but I, when there's a procedure in place and you're asking every MHA, there was, and there's two witnesses there. There was two witnesses there when I got out of my own seat, got up, walked around out of my own seat, and she chased me in my own seat in the government members, are, and I'm the bully. Miss Perry, you mean? Miss Perry, yes, definitely. Two witnesses. <laughs> and, and hold on, let me finish. Yep. She got the funding, most of the funding, she requested. So where does anybody, I, I, I'll, I'll challenge you, ask Tracy Perry, show you one email, one text, that I said anything derogatory. Joyce faces bullying and harassment allegations at the House of Assembly. Of course, her top story tonight here and now. But how do people on the West Coast feel about all of this? Joyce was born and raised in Curling and has been involved in politics in Humber Bay of Islands since 1989. Here and now's Colleen Connors joins us live now to get some reaction. So, Colleen, what were people uh, telling you today? Well, Anthony, this is Eddie Joyce land. This is where he people tell me that he goes to every function in their community. He goes to the fireman's ball, the student speak off and even the funerals in places like Humber Arm South behind me tonight and then all over here, what we call across the bay, all part of his district. And people there are not afraid to say what they think of Eddie Joyce. I think Eddie Joyce is a fine gentleman. That's the common sentiment here today at this convenience store. A uh, fine gentleman. And why do you say that? Because he is. Simple. Joyce attends many of his district's functions. He helped out a lot during the floods and storms in January, delivering food to cut off communities. People here don't want to think the worst of Joyce. He's represented them for decades. It's kind of not like Eddie Joyce's personality to be like that. He's always a very... I don't know, he is a very upbeat, lively, good sense of humor guy, right? So maybe something might have been took out of context or something, I don't know. Former mayor of the area, Arch Mitchell, sings Joyce's praises. And if I could pick a guy to represent us or to represent the district, it would be Eddie Joyce. Absolutely unequivocally, yes. But he believes an external review of the harassment allegations is the right move. I think that Eddie and the Premier are doing the right thing at this time until the investigation is concluded and let's see what comes of it. The former mayor of Cornerbrook does not agree. Charles Pender believes Joyce leaving Cabinet is an appropriate course of action. It's been a long time coming, he wrote in a tweet today. Pender told CBC he's found Joyce's behaviour to be intimidating in previous encounters, including with the Waste Management Board. Now, Pender says he doesn't like the way Eddie Joyce uses his position to twist people's arms in meetings and use some power and to get what he wants in these meetings. But like I said, most people that I spoke to today in his district think that he is a kind, good politician. Live in Cornerbrook tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. So you're looking at the back of Royce White's shirt, which says MVP. So the London Lightning are hoping that they're going to get a big night from their big player as the London Lightning gets set to play the St. John's Edge in about 30 minutes here at Mile One Stadium. I'm live and I'll have more on this story coming up.
Welcome back once again. Usually we introduce Ryan to the program. He is off today and CBC meteorologist Jay Scotland is filling in with a look at our tonight and tomorrow weather details. Well, Debbie, Anthony, temperatures across Newfoundland today anyway were fairly mild, very warm, actually seeing temperatures into the high teens. I know it was more of a seasonal to maybe for some below seasonal affair across Labrador. Uh, we have some pretty soggy conditions there to talk about. Also some pretty soggy conditions tonight to talk about across the uh, southern coast of Newfoundland as well. We have some advisories in place. Labrador City could see an additional 5 to 10 millimeters of rain. You head through Churchill Valley, uh, Churchill Falls, this is where you are looking at an additional 10 to 20 millimeters of rain tonight, so some localized flooding, a bit of a concern there. As we look to uh, Conagra, Bergio area along the south coast, rainfall warning in effect. Tonight amounts could top 30 millimeters of rain, and we've got that wind warning in effect as we look from Cornerbrook down to Port Basque, and this is where along the west coast we could be seeing winds easily in excess this evening and into the overnight hours out of the southeast of 100 kilometers per hour down to the Port Basque area. Could see those gusts approaching 140 kilometers per hour, so those winds will be rocking and they're initially out of the southeast being wrapped in by this area of low pressure as it continues its track to the north and east you can see the heavier rain falling over western Labrador and along the south shore hence those rainfall warnings those advisories that are in effect as the system through tomorrow morning starts to move over Labrador we'll see more of a southwesterly wind setting up across Newfoundland some heavier periods of rain will start to work east towards the Avalon Peninsula so pretty soggy conditions through the first half of the day tomorrow for St. John's watching for that precipitation to take off, but as we look to northern Labrador, mixing in with some wet snow into tomorrow morning and the more of a west to northwesterly wind across Labrador, meaning cooler temperatures for western Labrador tomorrow, milder temperatures, but pretty windy conditions across Newfoundland where into the St. John's area, those gusts could be topping 60 for coastal areas, upwards of 80 kilometers per hour. There's a weak trough that will bring some late day precipitation into western Labrador as well. There's a look at your overnight conditions uh, across Newfoundland and Labrador. Again, you've got the cooler conditions over western Lab where you could be seeing some flurries mixing in with that rain as the steadier rain is tapering off. We'll watch for some pretty wet conditions along the southern shore of Newfoundland as well with temperatures between 3 and 7 degrees. Into tomorrow, more of a cool west to northwest wind across Labrador. Uh, precipitation tapering off through the first half of the day. Watch for a few flurries as we look up into a northern part of Labrador and across uh, Newfoundland. Going to be seeing uh, some drizzle and some fog as we uh, see that rain start to taper off into the afternoon along the uh, west coast. Watch for some breaks of sunshine, though, later in the day, central and eastern Newfoundland. And as we take a look over the next seven days, pretty mild conditions across Newfoundland until we get into the latter part of next week. We'll see a return to more seasonal, even slightly below seasonal values possible. Still a good run of numbers into the teens. And as we take a look at Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador West, you can see some cooler temperatures as we look into uh, tomorrow. As we look into the long range, though, not bad into the mid to high single digits as we take a look at that long range forecast. Of course, the big concern tonight, that rainfall warning into western Labrador along the south shore of Newfoundland. And of course, those gusty winds from Cornerbrook down to Port Basque. Watch for those winds into the Port Basque area, gusting to about 140 kilometers per hour. Debbie and Anthony. Thanks very much, Jay. That's uh, meteorologist Jay Scotland covering the weather tonight for us from PEI. Well, a swimmer in St. John's is heading to a major competition. 17-year-old Noah Cumbie will represent Canada in August at the Junior Pan Pacific Championships. Yeah, take a look and enjoy this profile that Jeremy Eaton put together. You know, in terms of under 18 swimmers, Noah's 17 years old. He is the elite of the elites. He's the second fastest hunter freestyler under 18 in the country. He just finished sixth at our national championships. He is on his way and has the potential to be truly elite. Hi, I'm Noah Cumbie and I swim for the St. John's Legends. So when did you figure that you could probably, uh, you know, take this a little step further and, and move outside of St. John's? Well, it was always a goal, I think, but it didn't really uh, come full picture till a couple years ago when I started moving up in the country and placing at these big meets. Noah's going to be attending the Junior Pan Pacific Championships in Fiji this summer. It's an under-18 showcase meet of some of the best swimmers from Pacific Rim countries, Canada, the U.S., Australia, Japan, and it's a chance for him to go test himself on the world level for the first time. I swim 100 meter freestyle, so they take four guys for that, and I was second fastest on the, out of those people, so I got to get on the team for that. 
Now, 100 meters, for those who don't know, are you swimming 50 meter pool or 25? 50 meter pool. So that's two laps. How quick can Noah Cumbie do two laps of the pool? Uh, 51.47 seconds. I mean, I think I always work as hard as I can, but I think it'll be that extra pushing, knowing I gotta beat some of these guys that I've never raced before. We're going four 150s, and we're gonna go them on 215. The whole point is I want you to increase your stroke rate by 50, right? So we're gonna start somewhere at a stroke rate around 40. It's a huge step for swimming in our province. You know, for us, it's the first time in 35 years that we put someone on a national team, able body other than Katarita Roxon. Um, so, and the first male to be on a national team out of Newfoundland here. So we're pretty fired up about that. Uh, he's one of 13 men on the team, and he's the only male east of Montreal on the team, so we're pretty excited about that. I'm going to be going to Texas Christian University in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And I kind of always wanted to swim Division I in the States, especially growing up in the U.S. That's the thing to do. And when the recruiting period came along, uh, Texas Christian emailed me, got, got things going, got things rolling. And I got down on a visit, and I just loved it. And they wanted to take a chance on me, so I decided to take a chance on them. And I'm excited to uh, be representing them for the next four years. We're going to have to work hand in hand with his university club and his university team and make sure he stays on the path. That's something that I'm interested in, something that he's interested in, and it's something that TCU's been interested in. So we have a very clear vision of trying to get this young man on the 2020 Olympic team for Tokyo. Well, Jerry Meaton produced that, and when he's not at the pool, he's at mile one. Of course, the edge are there. Big game tonight, game five. Jeremy, a big one. Just how significant is tonight's game? Well, this is the best of seven series, but because the teams are tied at two games apiece, this is now the best of three. So this will be the last game in this series played here at Mile One Center. And that means the Edge are hoping that they can pick up a big win, because if not, these guys here on the floor will have to go to London, Ontario and win two games, and that's something that they don't want to do. Now, talking to the coaches and the players what the Edge need to do to win, they got to hit their shots, especially from behind the arc. And the other thing that they're going to have to figure out how to do is how to stop Royce White. Royce White has been a St. John's Edge killer in this series, scoring more than 30 points in every single game. So we're about 20, 21 minutes away from tip-off time, and the fans are starting to pile in. The staff here at Mile One say that there's been more than 4,500 tickets sold for this game. So a lot of people are excited and hoping that the home team can come out on top and move on to the NBL Finals in their first ever season. Now, the, the Deputy Commissioner of the NBL has just walked into the building, so we're going to meet him coming up in our next tip. So reporting live from Mile One, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. These students have been given a pretty difficult task. They're designing a school for Mars. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, today I had the pleasure of emceeing a big event for about 175 science students from across Newfoundland and Labrador who gathered for a very intense day of learning at the St. John's Convention Center. The aim of the Canada 2067 Youth Summit is to promote STEM. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Math. The students heard from entrepreneurs of all ages who have had success in a whole bunch of areas, from aerospace and oil exploration to work safety innovators, and a grade 10 student who invented a water purification system that's currently being used in some developing countries. Is part of the idea of this, something like this is to sort of promote and enforce the notion that science, technology, engineering and math needs to be a greater part of our education systems across the country? It's really critical that we do pay more attention to STEM learning. Not only is it going to be critical for us dealing with issues like climate change or feeding the world and, and providing safe drinking water, but the kinds of skills that you develop doing meaningful science learning really builds the kinds of skills that every job needs. And so critical thinking, problem solving, communication skills. With Canada 2067, we're really trying to get that on the map of, of talking about why inquiry-based learning is really critical for our kids future how the future is is coming quickly and changing very very rapidly and why those kinds of skills and attributes are going to be so critical for their success what do you hope they take away from today well I hope we take away some of their brilliant ideas of what they would do to improve education and I hope they take away inspiration from the speakers that we had this morning and recognition that their voice is really important that they can help shape the future of their own learning and that they actually can control some of the choices that they make going forward hoping they'll keep their doors open as long as possible and stay engaged with science and technology. So I designed a water pasteurization system for third world countries and it basically uses solar pasteurization and UV radiation to kill and inactivate the bacteria. So it's made from accessible materials that everyone has access to. First the water is pumped from water holes or lakes and then it runs through a basic cotton and charcoal filter system. So once it gets through that system, two liter bottles are filled and you would remove those and place your novel color changing wax indicator inside. So this is the main part of my system and it basically tells the people when the water's heating up and when it's safe to drink. So my goal with the system was to make it um, accessible, sustainable for these uh, small communities, schools, and right now my system is being used in Uganda at a grocery school and I basically just wanted to tell the kids today that you're gonna run into obstacles but if you find a passion and stick with it it can bring you to levels that you never would have dreamt of so yeah just because you're a kid doesn't mean that you can't make a difference seeing how STEM is applied in the real world and all the possibilities that we have here as students it's really inspirational and really just provides us the um, push to make a change, especially since we're so young and have so much time ahead of us. So how does working with all these other science students from across Newfoundland Labrador, how does that help you think uh, get better? It provides like different perspectives on the different subjects and may even help refine my field of um, work because at the moment I'm kind of undecided. I have engineering but don't know what type of engineering and even kind of provides me with some alternatives and what I can do in the future. The world and school has been the same for so many years and I think that the next step with technology is really getting the future generation to open their minds and see how we can improve in the future and get even more jobs and opportunities for people. So what do you hope to get out of a day like today? Well. I'm hoping in going into the medical field when I get older, but I'm also very big in music, so I'd love to find a way to um, incorporate music into the medical field with not only music therapy, but going even further and with further research and helping people and trying to cure people with just something as simple as music that's been around forever. When I first came in here, I had no idea what to expect, so when I came in, it was such an overwhelming feeling and just to see people of the same age with the same mentality as you and hoping to create the future and have such a positive impact on it is a great feeling. So there's a great feeling in that wow. room, Debbie, these students from all across the province uh, trying Bright to get together. lights, mm -hmm. with beautiful minds and they are our future. Yeah. And the mayor of St. John's, Danny Breen, was a guy who got to tell them this is your mission this afternoon and that they had to do, design a school on Mars and the kids were all like what? and they just ran off to it and they were all starting their planning and it was fantastic to watch. It's really really great 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 meeting of, of smart kids.
Now, if you've got a story or a news tip for us, please get in touch. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at CBCNL. We're back in just a bit. Time now to meet our young athlete of the day. This is seven-year-old Axel Williams of New Harbor. Axel was a member of Precision Taekwondo and was training for his blue belt. Blue belt, very good. Congratulations on being chosen as our young athlete of the day, Axel. Now to some national news. Three of the ten people killed in the Toronto ban attack Monday were Korean. A high percentage, which says a lot about the area where the attack happened. As Ron Charles tells us, the Korean community there is strong and they are coming together to help those most affected to heal. Shops and restaurants started reopening today along the stretch of Young Street where 10 people died in Monday's van attack. Many of the area's businesses are owned by Korean Canadians who arrived in the 1990s as immigrant investors. Restaurant owner Che Kim says the attack is having a lasting effect on the community. Day by day, uh, my sadness is getting to be deeper and deeper. And so, you know, in my head, uh, the scene of what I saw is always with me. So it makes me, I mean, very, very difficult. You know, a couple of my staff, they are struggling, same emotional problems. The Korean embassy says two of the dead are from Korea. A third, Chef Chul Min Eri Gang, is of Korean origin. I can't help but break down. Shop manager Shauna Han saw the van hit Gong and rushed to his side. I was trying to talk to him just to keep him alive and just to know that I was there and I was like praying for him too. Um, I was just trying to get him to respond, but he, he didn't. The deaths have turned this new but familiar home to so many into a place of dread for some. I feel so sad because as an international student, you know, I'm also Korean. There was two Korean victims among the victims there. So it could be me. So 
so I feel so scared. I thought Toronto is really safe city. John Ko, head of the Canadian Korean Business Association of North Toronto, says his members are now thinking about those left behind. But they're concerned more the victims and families. Of course, this is really, really a hard situation, especially that it's a little Korea town. A lot of Korean business are there. Oh, I'm a piece. Korean community organizations are now working to support family members traveling from Korea to Canada to bury the dead and comfort the injured. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. There's been an outcry from truck drivers after the Humboldt tragedy over lax standards in driver training. Instructors say the testing is too easy and that lives are in danger when ill-prepared truckers hit the road. And in most provinces, training isn't even required. The CBC's Olivia Stefanovic got in the cab with one, instru one instructor rather, to see what it takes at the wheel of a big rig and what's at stake. So as a truck driver, I had to watch all the signs. Eugene Prokop makes it look easy, but this is hard work. He wanted to just sneak in, but he saw my maneuver and he slowed down. He has to be careful. Exactly he carries right. 30 tons, a full load. When you do it right, this is actually fun, but you have to be safe. Have you had any close calls? Yes, I did. Prokot says he once avoided a pileup in Chicago by driving into a ditch. He wasn't hurt thanks to experience. But when it comes to drivers, that's, that's the big issue here. The requirements to get a truck driver's license vary across Canada. Ontario is the only province where truck driving training is mandatory. In Saskatchewan and elsewhere, it's optional. And is we need to take the control away from the individual provinces. Reg Lewis lost his parents and three other family members in a head-on collision with a semi nearly 30 years ago. Lewis says the exams are too easy. He says he and other instructors are knowingly sending hundreds of ill-prepared drivers behind the wheel. This is something that has to change. We have to get higher standards. I did this as a reminder. Vince Trombley wears the names of his children on his sleeves, a way to keep in mind that no delivery deadline is worth taking a chance on the road. My end goal is that I get home safely. Transport Canada says it supports the mandatory training of commercial drivers, but those changes lie with the provinces and territories. The Saskatchewan government says it's optimistic training will eventually become mandatory, but so far there's no time frame. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Weyburn. Gearing up for Game 5 between the St. John's Edge and London Lightning. We're back right after the break.
Welcome back. Well, of course, a big story everyone, or many royal fans at least, are eagerly awaiting is Prince Harry's wedding next month. What? Prince yes. Harry's getting married? Yes. <laughs> <There's heard? laughs> one British couple doesn't want their pampered pet to be left out of the celebrations. So the owners commissioned a two-meter-high kennel made to look like Windsor <laughs> Castle. It's for their dog, Archie. There you go. They spent nearly $9,000 wow. to make this mini castle for the 10-year-old pooch. And the attention to detail, well, that might be lost on the new occupant. But, hey, it's all there. Oh, my goodness. Uh, all there, including the fluttering union and royal standard flags. Harry and Meghan Markle are set to tie the knot at the original Windsor Castle, May 19th. All right, before we check out for the night, let's go back to Jeremy Eaton live at mile one one last time. Jeremy, everybody's set for the big tip off. Prince. They certainly are, and we got a very really special guest who's going to jump right into it. This is Audley Stevenson. He's a deputy commissioner of the NBL. Audley, welcome to St. John's. It's a great to be here. I love being here. It's a fabulous energy atmosphere, and I'm just really excited about the big game coming up. Now, before we get into the big game, we've got to talk a little bit of a controversy happened. Uh, the Royce White incident. Uh, what happened on the NBL side? Like, what did you guys do in that uh, alleged incident? Well, you know, we received the complaints. Uh, we investigated right away. I mean, matters like this are important to us. We do care about them and certainly want to take action. Uh, we investigated. We received several statements. Unfortunately, those statements were contrary to what the initial complaints were. And, and, and that's why there wasn't any immediate action taken, because it was really two sides of the story. And I mean, those situations, and, you know, how do you ascertain which is right which is wrong. Now we're going to switch gears really quick so we only got a few minutes. You're in St. John's. You're here on opening night. You're here for game five of the playoffs. What do you think of the St. John's Edge in their first season? Fabulous season. Fabulous year. Uh, the support from the fans has been, I mean, the atmosphere in the building, they're excited. It's so nice to be here now because uh, I think back to opening night, what that like, what that energy was like and that excitement. And it's continued in the playoffs and a great playoff run. So it's fantastic. As a league, we're thrilled. <laughs> now uh, we only got 20 seconds, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Who do you think is going to win tonight? Oh, my goodness. I you know what? I, 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 I'm spe For the first time, I'm speechless. I really don't know. I, I want a great game. I think we're going to have one. With a, it's an important game five. Well, oddly, Stevenson, the Deputy Commissioner of the NBL Canada, we appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. Game Thank is you. about to start here. We've got another 45 seconds, and that's it for me. Reporting live, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. I believe that is I the first time he was that speechless. Guy says he's speechless. He's telling the truth. <laughs> That's our program for this evening. We'll leave you tonight with some people in St. John's enjoying the sunny sunshine during the lunch hour. Good night, everyone.